Caregiving can sometimes feel like an impossible struggle. Caregivers may be torn between taking care of loved ones and trying to maintain balance in life. The good news is that it doesn't have to be that way. The Caring Generation with host Pamela D. Wilson is here to focus on the conversation of caring. You're not alone. In fact, you're in exactly the right place to share stories and learn tips and resources to help you and your loved ones. So now, please welcome the host of The Caring Generation, Pamela D. Wilson. This is Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert, speaker, consultant, and guardian of The Caring Generation. Caring Generation focuses on the conversation of caring, giving us permission to talk about aging, the challenges of caregiving, and everything in between. It's no surprise that needing care or becoming a caregiver changes everything. The Caring Generation is here to guide you along the journey to let you know that you're not alone. You are in exactly the right place to share stories, learn about caregiving programs and resources to help you and your loved ones plan for what's ahead. Invite your aging parents, spouses, family, and friends to listen to the show each week. If you have a question or an idea for a future program, share your idea with me by responding to my social media posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. This week by caregiver request, I'm answering the question, when should elderly parents stop living alone? We will talk about signs of frailty, which can indicate that parents are getting weaker, which can also be signs that caregivers should take better care of themselves. Last week, I talked about the four M's. We'll touch on these briefly and then talk in general about other areas that raise the question. When should elderly parents stop living alone? The guest for today's program will talk about staying healthy by keeping the immune system healthy. He shares practical tips for health conditions that many caregivers are also affected by. Dr. Gary Kaplan is a pioneer and leader in the field of integrative medicine. Dr. Kaplan is one of only 19 physicians in the United States to be board certified in both family medicine and pain medicine. He's the founder and medical director of the Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine, which offers patients suffering with chronic pain and illness a more effective way to get treatment. In 2015, he established the Foundation for Total Recovery in order to help find a cure for all who suffer with chronic pain and depression by educating patients and partnering with leading researchers, academics, and innovators, and studying data to find a baseline approach to diagnosing and curing neuro neuroinflammation. He has a new book that's out. It is called, Why Are You Still Sick? How Infections Can Break Your Immune System and How You Can Recover. Links to all of Dr. Kaplan's information will be in this show transcript on my website at PamelaDWilson.com. Click on the media tab and then the Caring Generation to search for episode 138. When should elderly parents stop living alone is a great question. There are many factors contributing to frailty, which is a medical speak term that you might hear doctors or the healthcare system use. But what is frailty? In general terms, frailty means being weak and it mostly applies to older adults. Frailty can mean that elderly parents are more susceptible to colds and infections and if they do get some type of bug, it can take longer than normal for them to recover. So in a sense, frailty also relates to resilience, which is in this aspect, the ability to physically bounce back from being sick. Elderly who are frail may be generally healthy with maybe only a couple of health problems, or you may have a parent who has a lot of health conditions. But in many cases, or either case actually, the experience of having a 
urinary tract infection, or pneumonia, can lead to this downward spiral of parents having more health issues that negatively impact their health and well-being, which then means that they need more care from their caregivers. According to some statistics from Age UK, around 10% of people age 65 and older live with frailty. This figure rises to anywhere between 25 and 50% for people over age 85. So it shows that there's a significant change between 65 and 85. So to answer the question of when should elderly parents stop living alone, let's look at five things related to frailty that you might be noticing if you are caring for an aging parent. The first is unintentional weight loss, which can be hard to spot if you see a parent all the time, or if your parents wear baggy clothing that hides how thin they might be. The only way really to measure weight is to put a parent on the scale and track the numbers every week. Weight loss can relate to other conditions like depression that can result in a parent not wanting to eat. If your parent sits all day and they're not physically active, they may not work up an appetite, so you may hear them say, oh, I'm, I'm just not hungry. Stomach problems like indigestion can also result in not wanting to eat. Add to this poor nutrition, which is a big concern for the elderly, many of whom are malnutritioned, but you would never know it. I think the stats are 47% of people who are older are malnutritioned. Poor nutrition can result in a long list of other health issues. And even if someone is overweight, that does not mean that they are not malnutritioned. In the second half of the program, Dr. Kaplan, who joins us, will address nutrition and stomach problems like indigestion and how these, if not managed, can negatively affect the immune system, even the immune system of caregivers, which contributes to everyone's ability to bounce back from health problems. The number two frailty factor for when should elderly parents stop living alone is exhaustion. Are your parents tired? all the time. Do they sleep all day, sit in a chair and watch television and kind of doze in and out? Does any type of activity result in parents being out of breath? Exhaustion. I know many caregivers who experience exhaustion. This means that all you want to do is sleep. So many caregivers tell me that they just dream of being able to take a nap or really getting a full night's sleep without being woken up by something or someone. There are any number of reasons for feeling exhausted. Undiagnosed or poorly managed medical conditions could be a reason. A lack of sleep, restless leg syndrome that can keep you awake all night, not getting proper exercise and having poor nutrition can be reasons where you don't sleep and you feel exhausted. So how many of you see the theme here between the factors of frailty and how you feel every day how your aging parents feel every day. Aspects that relate to being frail contribute to risks for parents who live alone. Frailty can lead to health events that need fast medical treatment. And if a parent isn't proactive in seeing a doctor regularly to prevent health from worsening, they may also hesitate to call 911 because they may not think a condition is serious and then as the caregiver, you have a very serious, time-consuming situation on your hands. These type of worries may have you asking, when should elderly parents stop living alone? Number three for frailty is low energy, and this is different from being exhausted. Health conditions like heart disease, COPD, which is a breathing concern, cancer, autoimmune diseases like lupus, multiple sclerosis or anemia can cause low energy. Low energy can also be a sign of depression or anxiety and believe it or not sometimes it's a side effect of medications that are supposed to be helping you but they cause other complications. It's extremely important for the elderly to have access to a good physician 
and to attend regular medical appointments so that any medically related causes for exhaustion, low energy, weight gain, weight loss, or any other conditions can be called attention to because many elderly parents want to stay in their homes. They want to live there. And to do that, their health has to be managed. Fourth in the list of frailty is hand grip strength. While this probably sounds like a really odd measure of strength, weak hand strength can be a sign of overall physical weakness, in a sense a loss of muscle mass. Beginning at age 40, muscle mass and strength begin to decline. So we're all experiencing this. If we're over 40, we're on that downhill slide unless we choose to do something about it. Exercise. Strength training, lifting weights, being active. A strong grip at an older age is an indicator of living longer. In a research article by Joanna Dudinska Grisick and others, published in Clin Clinical Interventions in Aging, there'll be a link in this podcast. Grip strength is influenced by multiple health factors, and it's one of the top predictors of poor health outcomes, disability, and death in older people who have chronic health conditions. Other research by Urbano and others confirms that hand grip strength may be an early indicator and the onset of frailty. So in a sense, it's a warning sign for caregivers that other conditions might be present, confirming that your parents will need more care or maybe they're not safe to continue to live at home or you need to look at bringing care in. The fifth frailty factor is slow walking speed or gait issues, so that's balance. And I talk about these all the time in relation to potentially being an early sign for dementia, Alzheimer's, or Parkinson's disease. Now, admittedly, there can be other physical reasons for a low walking speed or balance issues, like a previous fracture or knee replacement, hip replacement, arthritis, or other functional body structure concerns. So here's a few questions for you. Can you or your parents lift and carry 10 pounds easily? Can you walk up a flight of steps without becoming out of breath? Walk a block. Can you stand up from a chair without holding on to its arms? Can you raise your arms all the way above your head? Can you stand on one leg for any length of time? If you're noticing difficulties or weakness in any of these areas, that means that you have a physical strength issue. You're losing muscle mass. What about your parents being able to perform activities of daily living? Things like bathing or showering, using the bathroom, preparing and eating a meal, and dressing. Trouble with any of these can really lead to the question of when should elderly parents stop living alone or when do we need to bring in other support? Issues of frailty, a lack of medical care, so not going to the doctor if a person has multiple health conditions, and difficulty managing independently at home. They're all indicators of potential safety risks. Separate of these, people with dementia, Alzheimer's, or any type of memory loss, they have a higher risk of being able to live alone safely as that memory loss progresses. So if you're worried about when should elderly parents stop living alone at home, the biggest thing that you can do is take an interest in your parents' health and medical care if they will allow you. Some parents don't want their children interfering. I get it. Ask if you can attend medical appointments with your parents to learn about their health conditions, the medications they take, and even ask the doctor to complete a frailty assessment. Last week on the show, episode B137, when I spoke about the four M's and what matters most to the care of parents, I spoke about having conversations about care, things like what parents want and what they don't want. Mom or dad may want to stay in their home, 
realizing the potential risks, or they may choose hospice care over extensive medical treatment. Now, this is their choice, even if you disagree. Just as it will be your choice someday when you are the person who needs care. The other M's are medication, mental status, so things like dementia, Alzheimer's, and mobility, which we are talking about in this program. So all of this really links together. Other health concerns related to when should elderly parents stop living alone include multiple hospitalizations. How many times have your parents been in the hospital in the past 12 months or 24 months? Are they having recurring infections? These are signs that your parents' health is struggling, that the body's resilience and ability to bounce back from sickness is low, and that the immune system is struggling for one reason or another. Now, there's a point where it's really difficult to turn all of this around, which is why we're talking about noticing these signs earlier so that you can take preventative action to help your parents manage this. But truly, if the, if the care has gone beyond the point where you're going to be able to turn it around and it has to be managed and your parents are having more and more issues, bringing care into the home can help with issues of frailty. For example, weight loss through better nutrition, maybe somebody cooking meals or, you know, making some protein supplement drinks. Walking speed can be managed through exercise, even if those exercises are just walking around the house or, or taking a walk outside. Medication reminding and socialization can be very beneficial for elderly parents. Now, on the other hand, if you're looking for outside of the home, care homes also provide this degree of support plus 24 hour availability from their staff and somebody there in the event of a health emergency. The benefits of a care home include socialization, good nutrition, mental and physical activity to keep the brain and the body going, and in many cases, having access to a nurse or a doctor who can be called or who visits that community. And so what this means is you've got a lot more support in one place to really relieve worry for you about the caregiver of when should elderly parents stop living alone. As a caregiver for elderly parents, grandparents, or a spouse, it's true there are a lot of considerations, a lot of worries, and things to pay attention to that are signs that the health of a parent is declining. When you begin talking about these concerns as a family, you can all be more proactive to prevent falls, hospitalizations, or other events that will mean that a parent may not be able to live home alone. They may have to move. A lot of elderly parents want to remain living in the comfort of their homes, but they don't know what it takes to make this happen. This is where you as the caregiver comes in. You're here, you're seeking information, you are learning. Do something with this information. At any age, being proactive about health and self-care, it takes time, attention, dedication, and effort. There's really no way around doing things that keep us healthy if we want to remain healthy. On this topic coming up after the break, Dr. Gary Kaplan from the Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine will share a lot of practical advice about staying healthy by taking action to have a healthy immune system, which benefits the caregivers and the care receivers, everybody all around. Please pay it forward to help others dealing with health, aging, or caregiving issues by sharing information about this show and my website, PamelaDWilson.com. The Caring Generation podcasts are available worldwide on my website and your favorite podcast and music apps, Apple, Spotify, Spreaker, and more. You can also find links to all these on my website. As a caregiver, know that you don't have to go it alone. Caregiving doesn't have to be a do-it-yourself job. Hope, help, and support are on my website where you can schedule a one-to-one -one telephone or video consultation with me. Click on how I help, then family caregivers and elder care consultation.
You can also check out my online caregiver programs, resources, and support page. This is Pamela D. Wilson on The Caring Generation. Stay with me. I'll be right back. This is Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert, author, and speaker on The Caring Generation, where there are now over 130 episodes responding to questions from family caregivers. Visit my website, PamelaDWilson.com, where you will find my caregiving library, caregiving blog, it's called Caring for Aging Parents, online caregiver courses, and more. I'd like you to meet Dr. Gary Kaplan. He joins us to share a lot of very practical information about staying healthy and how to maintain your immune system. Whether you are a family caregiver, whether you are the person that needs care, and to help you look at the bigger picture of how little things that we can all do every day can help us have a better life, feel better, be healthier, and to be able to take care of the ones that we love. Dr. Kaplan, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Can you talk about how the body's immune system works? Absolutely. So the immune system's job is to protect us from the other, from bacteria, from viruses, from parasites. And so that's the job. The immune system has to recognize things that are not us and stop them from hurting us. And so uh, there's two big components of the immune system, the innate, which are the first responders, and then the acquired, which are all the uh, antibodies that we build up to things. And so you build antibodies, for instance, when you get immunizations. So the immune system, is its whole job is to prevent us from getting sick, or if we do get sick, to fix it so that uh, we get repaired and heal. And then there's this terminology called autoimmune disorders. What causes those? That's when the immune system gets a bit confused and it fails to recognize us from the other. And so now what happens is the, uh, our own immune systems start thinking that our tissues, in particular the brain and the conditions we're talking about here, but it can be also the intestines if you're talking about Crohn's disease. But uh, what happens is the immune system gets confused and it thinks that our own tissues are the problem, that we are the other. And so it starts to attack it the end result of which is we get very sick. And so if, if I'm a person and I, I'm thinking, gosh, do I have an autoimmune disorder? What, what would that be called? So there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of things that we call autoimmune diseases. The classic autoimmune diseases are things like rheumatoid arthritis or things like lupus, uh, Crohn's disease, uh, but, and, and uh, multiple sclerosis. But there's a whole new group of diseases that actually are autoimmune diseases. And they include things like uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, problems with uh, chronic uh, pain syndromes. Uh, Post-COVID is a problem where the immune system's been broken and that's the problem, it's no longer the virus. Problems with chronic Lyme disease and things like anxiety uh, disorders can all actually be problems where the immune system has mistakenly attacked ourselves and is now inflaming our brains. And we're getting all of these symptoms of pain, sleep disturbances, focus and concentration issues. And when it really gets inflamed, you can get things like Alzheimer's, you can get things like Parkinson's disease. So this business of keeping the immune system happy and healthy is absolutely crucial for us to be healthy and happy. And so how do we do that? How do we keep the immune system healthy? Well, there's a a lot of things that are kind of the basics, one of which is sleep. We need to make sure we're getting uh, not just enough sleep, but the right kind of sleep. So we need to make sure that we're getting, and a study just came out yesterday, as a matter of fact, that looked at exactly what is the right amount of sleep. And the answer is seven hours. Uh, And maybe eight to nine on either side of that, but seven hours is kind of the sweet spot uh, for ideal, uh, optimal immune functioning. So 
you want to make sure you're going to bed at the same time every night, you're getting up at the same time every day, and that you're sleeping solidly through the night. You also want to make sure that you're breathing throughout the night, because about 5% 5 5 of people have a condition called uh, sleep apnea, where they stop breathing at night. They have very loud snores, typically. And about 85% of the people who have sleep apnea don't know it. The end result of which is uh, they're waking up exhausted, no matter how much sleep they get, they're dozing off during the day, they're falling asleep watching movies, or uh, even in conversations with people, they can be falling asleep. And worse, they can be falling asleep at the wheel of a car. And their brains are not functioning well because they're not sleeping. So if you're suspicious that you've got sleep apnea, you need to talk to your doctor about it because it's easy to fix and may save your life. It can prevent the occurrence of hypertension. It can prevent the occurrence of cognitive problems and prevent car accidents. So sleep is really, really important, not just for the, the older person who people may be caring for, but the caregivers themselves. Because if the caregivers themselves are not getting adequate sleep, their judgment's impaired. And they're going to make decisions that they're going to regret later. So having adequate sleep is important for everybody involved. The next thing would be diet. You want to make sure that you're eating a good, clean diet. You want to make sure you're eating foods that support you and not eating junk foods and packaged foods. You want to eat as much fresh foods uh, as possible. So that's going to help keep you healthy. And then you want to make sure that you're getting adequate exercise. Exercise is probably the single best anti-inflammatory for the brain we have. So exercise is important. And exercise doesn't have to be running a mile or two miles. Exercise may just be walking. And it may be walking 3,000, 5,000 steps a day, whatever you can do. But we want to keep you moving. And so those are the big things. And then meditation, we know, is also an excellent anti-inflammatory in the body and helps calm down the immune system. So diet, sleep, exercise, and meditation, things you've all heard before. But the reality is the science is there. And it's extremely important to take care of yourself. So caregivers are some of the most stressed out people I know, and they probably get headaches and take a leave and Advil and maybe some of those over-the-counter stomach things. So what effect does that have on the body and on the immune system? So an excellent question and a very important one, because the reality is taking anti-inflammatory medications like a leave or Advil on a regular basis causes ulcerations not just in the stomach, but really if you're taking it on a regular basis, 75% of people will end up with ulcerations in their small intestines. That's then going to cause problems with being able to absorb proper nutrients. It's going to cause problems with diarrhea or constipation, bloating, gas. And also the fact is without a healthy gut, you do not have a healthy brain. And so you have to make sure that you're not taking things that are doing damage to the gut. So a leave and Advil once in a while is one thing on a regular basis is probably doing a lot of damage. The other major medication that we need to be very careful about are the medications that suppress our stomach acid. Taking those on a regular basis actually has been shown to be linked with the development of Alzheimer's. And so again, we have a thing that's disrupting the health of the gut and the gut's not healthy, the brain's not healthy. And so it's important that we be very careful about what medications we're taking and what amounts of them we're taking uh, in order to protect the gut. Taking things like probiotics can be a nice way to getting a good probiotic, can be a nice way to help keep the gut healthy and keep you regular. Taking magnesium, which almost everybody is deficient in. Uh, magnesium taurate in particular can be helpful in terms of uh, revitalizing the brain, but magnesium Glycinate can be helpful in terms of if you're having problems with constipation, you just have to be careful how much you take, otherwise you'll create diarrhea. So those are two basic supplements. And another supplement, by the way, that you could take that'll help reduce some of the inflammation in the brain is melatonin, but you have to make sure you get a good quality product. And so caregivers, they're stressed, right? So they probably have upset stomachs a lot. And to your point, if you don't have a healthy gut, then you're going to have all kinds of problems. So and I know you mentioned some of these supplements, but if somebody has gone, let's say somebody's gone to the doctor mm -hmm. and the doctor's like, oh, just take this, you know, stomach acid thing. And, and they're taking it for years. And the minute that they stop taking it, they have like a, a upset stomach. What's, what's the solution to that? Or are there solutions? Oh, there are great solutions for that. One of which is simple stuff, ginger tea, get fresh ginger root, take 
carve the bark off, take about a one inch square of it, put it in a garlic press, squeeze that into hot water, and you can sip that. Ginger is lovely in terms of quieting down mucosal irritation, and thus the stomach ir inflammation. Another thing you can do is aloe vera juice, four ounces, three times a day, also great for healing the stomach and the mucosa. Deglycerinated licorice is another thing that can be taken in order to help uh, with uh, heartburn and stomach acid. You wanna make sure you're not taking real licorice because real licorice can cause high blood pressure. So deglycerinated licorice, DGL, is really important uh, in order to be able to help with heartburn. So those are some of the quick solutions because it does take a while for everything to come back into balance. If you've been on these antacids, uh, these acid suppressors for years, it's gonna take a little bit in order to balance things out. I'll tell you another way that I do it is I'll have people take something like Pepsid, which is a neutralizing uh, substance uh, as opposed to a total acid suppressor. And then what that what you can do is transition to that, okay, from the proton pump inhibitor, and taking uh, Pepsid uh, on a regular basis uh, then allows you to transition off that into something like the aloe vera juice uh, or the DGL. Uh, or the ginger tea. So all of those things can help get you off those things. And we really want to get you off those if at all possible. Earlier, you mentioned depression and anxiety being kind of like an autoimmune disorder. And I know a lot of people will just take, you know, antidepressants or, or things like that. Is there is there an alternative to those types of medications? There are. And, and I want to um, clarify that a bit. I look at depression and anxiety so as a neuroinflammatory disease. That is a brain on fire. Now, the cause of that may be an autoimmune process, but it can be other things that create the problem because the innate immune system <coughs> uh, may be the problem here. So that inflammatory process can be reduced, uh, again, by taking something like melatonin. Resveratrol as a supplement can also be something that'll help. Again, we get back to proper sleep and proper exercise uh, in order to reduce that inflammation uh, in the brain. And doing that stuff on a regular basis, relaxation techniques, uh, you got to take care of yourself. If you can't take care, if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be any good to anyone else. And that's the most important thing of all, because uh, if you collapse, who's going to be there to, to pick the problems up? <laughs> that you is gotta, so true. Yeah. Earlier, I mentioned your book. And so now I kind of want to talk about where people can go for education and information if they're searching. And there's there's a website called the Foundation for Total Recovery. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. That was the foundation that I created after I wrote my first book. It's an education and research foundation. We recently held an international conference uh, on, if you'll excuse the expression, autoimmune encephalopathy of infectious etiology. It's a scientific meeting it was sponsored by Georgetown. Um, we had over 900 attendees. That conference is available uh, on the website at, on the Foundation for Total Recovery. Uh, there's a small fee involved uh, for two and a half days worth of the conference, but it's an excellent place to get top-notch education from some of the leading thought leaders in the profession uh, talking about this stuff. Some of it's a little too much, but a lot of it is very accessible to the general public. And in fact, we had probably about 300 or 400 of the general public in attendance at that meeting and got rave reviews on it. So. Uh, that conference, which was held in February of this year, is available on the Foundation website, a great place to get resources. Additionally, within the book, I've got a lot of resources in terms of different labs that you can look at and go to their websites. They have information on stuff. There's a lot of information, uh, ways to educate yourself. Our own website has a lot of free information, lectures uh, we've given over the years uh, to get you uh, well-educated and help you help yourself. And so your your Center for Integrative Medicine, you're on the East Coast. If somebody is in Los Angeles or Texas or somewhere else, and they're looking for somebody like you, how do they find somebody like you? So they can uh, they can sometimes go to so the Institute of Functional Medicine, uh, might be a group of people, uh, have access to a group of people that uh, can help them. Uh, ILADS, uh, the International Association for Lyme-Related Diseases. ILADS has a great physician referral list, and there's a number of good physicians there. The American Holistic Medical Association has a number of physicians' uh, referrals within your area. So there's you have to go look. You got to ask questions. You got to interview. The thing you need to keep in mind is that as physicians, we work for you. You hire us, you fire us. And if we're not working for you, if we're not paying attention to you, fire us. 
and go find somebody who does because you should not be locked into a physician just because uh, you went to this one doc. And, uh, you know, we all have different specialties and strengths. And so I really want people to be their own advocates and make sure that they're being listened to. Uh, there are people that we see from around the country. Uh, so to a certain extent, we can sometimes be that physician. But uh, there are only a couple of us here. So we really need uh, to connect with other physicians around the country and around the world, for that matter, who can do this kind of medicine. And we're also geared toward educating those physicians. Dr. Kaplan, I thank you so much for joining me. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we sign off? I want people to understand that they can get better. I want people to understand that uh, there is hope and we're only getting better at what we do and take care of yourself so that uh, as we get better, we get better answers for you in the immediate future and there's better for you and for your loved ones. Thank you so much. Pamela, a pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show. Caregivers, all great information from Dr. Gary Kaplan, tips and practical steps that we can all use. Thank you for joining me for this program. If you want to share your story or have a request for a podcast topic, video, or article, visit my website, PamelaDWilson.com, and go to the Contact Me drop-down in the top navigation bar, then click on Caregiver Survey. You can also respond to any of my social media posts, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, my YouTube videos, and ask me to do a video or an article for you. Please share The Caring Generation on my website with everyone you know who is interested in proven, reliable tips, information, resources, and research about caregiving, aging, health, and everything in between. There are always links in all of these show transcripts to research and helpful information. This is Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert, advocate, and speaker. I look forward to being with you again soon. God bless you all. Sleep well tonight. Have a fabulous day tomorrow and a great week until we are here together again. Tune in each week for The Caring Generation with host Pamela D. Wilson. Come join the conversation and see how Pamela can provide solutions and peace of mind for everyone. Here on Pamela D. Wilson's The Caring Generation.